Welcome. Welcome to our second Inspiring Engineers event. It is wonderful to have you all with us. My name is Helene Lawless. I'm an 87 Chem E grad, um, and I am the chair of the College and Alumni Engagement Committee for the Engineering Foundation Board of Directors. We have been so excited to launch this new series, really focused on celebrating NC State engineers who inspire. And NC State engineering education is a launch point for so many fantastic types of careers, and we want to hear about all of those. We want to celebrate and highlight the wide range of careers that to really create the opportunity to inspire our fellow alums. We're gonna be hosting webinars like this on a quarterly basis. And then in addition to that, we're also hosting an online series where on the web, we're getting the opportunity to hear all of these fantastic stories on social media, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So be sure to follow us at NC State College of Engineering and the hashtag NC State ENGR. We also encourage you to share a recording of today with your network to really get the word out about all that we're doing in the College of Engineering. There's a fantastic community that we've got together and we're committed to sharing great content and really keeping you connected to the college and the university and all of the college's award-winning departments and also your fellow alums. So be watching for more information. The next one of these fantastic events is gonna happen in May. But now on to the main event. Love, love, love seeing in the chat that we're already seeing lots of folks joining us and you're gonna love the time that you have today with the amazing Stephanie Easter. Stephanie is the VP of Strategy and Planning for the Defense and Civilian Sector at SAIC, Science Applications International Corporations. She's an 85 CHEMI grad who went on to receive her master's in engineering from the Catholic University of America. And prior to joining SAIC, she had an illustrious career across the US Navy and Army with a few key roles like being the executive director of the Navy's F-35 Joint Strike Program, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, and Director of Navy Staff in the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations. She was recognized by NC State as a distinguished engineering alumna, and I can't wait to hear about all of her stories. So leading our conversation today, I'm excited to turn things over to our own Assistant Dean of Development for the College of Engineering and Executive Director of the Engineering Foundation, Griffin Lamb. Take it away, Griffin. Thank you, Helene. And I want to extend another warm welcome to everyone joining us. Please use that chat. Tell us where you are zooming in from and pop your questions in there as the conversation unfolds. I'm going to be keeping my eye on it so that we can dig deeper with Stephanie over the next hour. So Stephanie, let me just open by saying you are inspiring and we at the College of Engineering at NC State are so proud to call you one of our own. So thank you for joining us today. And to get things started, why don't we go back to the very beginning? And why don't you tell us why you picked state? How did we get so lucky that you landed here as a student? Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, well, thank you, Griffin. And thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today to share a little bit about my story and hopefully encourage someone to kind of keep going and, and keep doing the great things all of you are doing. Um, how did I end up at NC State? Well, I grew up in Durham, North Carolina right outside of Raleigh. And to be honest, I actually was going to go to Clemson University in the beginning. I know, don't hate, don't hate, don't hate. Um, I applied to Clemson University. Um, I was accepted. They did not have on-campus housing at the time. And my parents were very excited about me going out of state. And I'd also uh, went to apply to NC State. And what really got me to NC State was really a summer program I participated in. I had the opportunity to do the minorities in engineering and technology, the MIC program that NC State offered as a high school student. And I fell in love. That's when I fell in love with engineering. And that's when I narrowed it down to NC State and Clemson and NC State won out. It was close to home, um, a better school in hindsight. And I'm glad I landed there. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that you wear red and not orange. So we're gonna <laughs> make sure that you wear your red with pride. Um, thanks for sharing that. I will put in a little plug for any parents joining us. We still have summer camps here for aspiring engineers. So get in touch with us if you would like your family to engage in that way. Stephanie, tell us then a little bit about your experience. What was it like when you landed here and when you reflect back on your undergraduate days? What can you share with us? 
Well, I have so many memories from NC State. Um, I still remember just being nervous about, you know, I was 17 years old when I came to NC State. And I remember being nervous, even though I wasn't that far from home and being in an environment where I didn't know a lot of people. And it was such a big place compared to everything I had experienced. So that summer program, I just want to go back on that, was very, very instrumental because it gave me an opportunity to get on campus and to see what it was like and become familiar with a couple of things. Um, but my freshman year at NC State was great. I met some amazing people, some who are joining us today. I, I know of because they sent me a note. But um, I do remember I, I grew up... Um, knowing that I wanted to do something very different. NC State was there as a great engineering school. And so when I showed up on campus, I had the opportunity to live over in the quad in Barrie. And back in 1980, when I started, um, NC State didn't have a cafeteria. So we cooked in our rooms and there was a little food shack right outside of the quad. And I remember that because it's one of my most vivid memories because every morning on my way to class, I stopped there and got what I call the breakfast of champions, a frosted strawberry pop tart and a bottle of orange juice. And that's what got me started throughout the day. Um, I really enjoyed NC State and the challenges that it gave me from an academic perspective, but I think what I enjoyed most was the relationships and the friendships that I got from being at NC State. I had the opportunity to participate in some extracurricular activities. And when you study in engineering at a school like NC State, and it's very um, demanding, especially chemical engineering, having an outlet is so important. And that outlet for me was dance visions. Um, it was a dance troupe at NC State. And I still remember um, doing practices in the old cultural center, which is a different building now over on West Campus, and doing recitals in Stewart Hall. I mean, it's through the auditorium. It was just um, a great experience. So, and walking through the tunnel and going into the library, I have just so many vivid memories about it. But to be honest, the other thing I remember was how hard I had to work mm -hmm. um, to get through that curriculum. And that is a big part of why I was able to accomplish a lot of the things that I was able to accomplish in my career. Yeah, yeah, I hear that a lot, Stephanie, from other alumni, the sense of pride for a job well done and all the effort you had to put into your undergraduate experience. I also hear alumni say a lot that they learned how to think like an engineer. And I love asking each engineer, well, what do you mean by that? Because it's not always the same definition. There are some similarities. I wonder if you would be willing to share your definition of what it means to learn how to think like an engineer. And then maybe we'll transition a little bit into how you took that into your professional life. Oh, definitely. Thinking like an engineer is, to me, is methodically going through situations and solving problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you're giving a, a mass of things, like how do you organize it? Um, to me, it's connecting dots figuring out what's related, what's not, what can I put to the side or what do I really need to have in order to solve this problem? I refer to it today as critical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the ability to navigate masses of data and information, discern what's most important, connect the dots and come up with a proposed way forward or solution set. That's what thinking like an engineer means for me. And it has been unbelievable in my career going forward. Yeah, and you've had an amazing career. In fact, I've heard a rumor that you once retired, but you're in such demand and you so enjoy thinking like, a, like an engineer that you came out of retirement. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. What's this current role um, that you're in as an engineer? And how do you, how do you come um, bring all that to your professional life, that way of engineering thinking? Okay. Well, I did retire um, after 34 years with the Department of Defense and um, had the opportunity to start there with hands-on engineering experience. And that's where I was able to definitely put into place the critical thinking skill sets that I learned at NC State. Because if you can imagine, I graduated with a chemical engineering degree, but the job I took at the Navy right out of college was as an avionic support equipment engineer. So that's an engineer. Most of the people around me were aerospace engineers or mechanical or electrical engineers. 
So it was that thinking like an engineer that allowed me to take my chemical engineering degree and apply it basically anywhere. Mm. Okay. And so I share that because now I am the vice president for strategy and planning, which has nothing to do with engineering or chemical engineering, but it is about connecting dots, seeing the big picture, being able to discern what's important and what's not important. So that's why I tell anybody, if you get an engineering degree from NC State, you can do anything. I mean, literally anything because it's about problem solving and thinking your way through any situation. Mm -hmm. So today I am fortunate enough to work for SAIC, helping them put together the strategy for their defense and civilian sector. And basically it's providing engineering services and support to the Department of Defense. So I did the job on the side of the government before. So now I'm on the industry side, helping them understand how the government works. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thank you for that background. Let's split the equation a little bit, right? Engineers can do anything. They can figure out the solutions to so many things, but maybe you could reflect on what have been some of the learning curves in this amazing career that you've built and where are some places where you've really been tested that might inspire, especially some of our younger alumni on the call today to keep going or to learn new skills and to think about how they operate in the workplace a little differently. Okay, well, uh, this is so timely. <laughs> One of the biggest challenges that I had throughout my career, and if I'm completely honest, I still struggle with a little bit today. As engineers, um, we are taught to be the very best at what we do. Okay, and as a African-American female engineer, um, that comes with a little extra set of pressure. So to prove yourself, to prove that I have the right. Um, when I came out of NC State, there weren't a lot of female engineers out there at all. It was kind of uncommon and a black female engineer was rare to, to be generous. So I, was, I continually put that pressure on myself to work hard, be the best that I could be and prove that I could do what I have been asked to do. As I progressed through my career into leadership roles, it was no longer about what I could do, but it was about what I could bring out of others. Mm -hmm. So I found myself in a position where me being the best at what I did was not sufficient. Mm -hmm. Okay. That wasn't my job anymore. And making that transition in your career at least for me, was a little challenging because when you're used to just delivering, when you're used to knowing I can do it, you have a tendency to do it. So you don't delegate. Mm -hmm. You don't lead at the level that you can. And so that was one of the biggest challenges and struggles I had through my career was making that transition from a doer to a leader of doers and not relying on all those great things I learned at NC State, mm -hmm. but trying to figure out how do I develop those things in other people? How do I pull them out of people and how do I help them to see it? Yeah, oh, thank you. That, that's just so helpful to see a little bit into you, right? And what it's like um, to be you in this career that you feel. I wonder if we could stick with this theme of leadership for a minute. And uh, that transition that you described is very challenging, but clearly you've made it. And I wonder if you have any leaders, either from your time at state or mentors or mentors and leaders in the field that you've looked up to and that have inspired you. And um, would you be willing to share and, and describe that person or persons with us today? Sure, I am a big advocate of mentoring. Um, I've had many throughout my career. I've been very fortunate and throughout my life. And it, it goes back to NC State. I, I talked about dance visions and how that was an integral part of my experience at NC State. The leader, our uh, sponsor for that was um, Wandra Hill. And she was probably the first mentor that I really had. And it wasn't about engineering. It wasn't about work. It was mentoring about life. How do you interact with people? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you find your voice? How do you speak up for yourself? And all those things at the time, I didn't appreciate until I found myself in 
a work environment where I had to do those things. So having mentors like her early in my life was instrumental. As I went to work for a Department of the Navy, I remember my first formal mentor, um, his name was John Lockhart, he's retired three-star admiral. And I remember talking to him about my career progression and he taught me what mentoring looks like. He said, you know, I can expose you to people you've never been exposed to. I can give you candid feedback about the things I think you need development on and I can open doors that may not normally be open for you. But that's all I can do for you. It's the way he put it, right? <laughs> and, and I'm like, that'll work. Yeah, the hard and truth. <laughs> it, exactly. Um, but he instilled in me, he was the type of mentor that helped develop my critical thinking skills mm -hmm. from technical things to more soft skills. So when I go to him with an issue, he never told me what to do. It was always, well, what do you think, Stephanie? So what, what, why are you thinking that? So he helped me to be able to do a lot of self-reflection mm -hmm. and to basically talk out loud and talk your way through things. Mm -hmm. The same thing I learned at NC State to do on a technical level, he helped me to do that on a personal and a leadership level. Yeah. And I had like three of him throughout my career. And so mm -hmm. I was very fortunate and very blessed. Yeah, yeah, no, those relationships sound so important. Um, but to include the fact that you were open to mentorship, right? That you sought this growth and and you welcomed that people care to challenge you and, and help you think about things. Oh, yeah, I mean, I there may be a few people out there that have it all together and can do it all on their own. That's just not my experience. Yeah. Um, one thing I've learned also through my leadership journey is we all have blind spots, right? And we have to be open to growth and to feedback and to other perspectives. So um, I just had to do that to survive. Other people do it to advance and some people do it because they just think it's the right thing to do. But um, having mentors and someone that you can trust and have candid conversations with, because that's another thing I learned, mentorship. A lot of people think of it and they make a distinction between a mentor, a coach, or a sponsor, or an advocate. When I say mentorship, I'm talking about all those things, mm -hmm. right? Because to me, it's about relationship. It's about someone that you trust, someone that you respect to the point where you will take their feedback and act on it someone that you respect enough that you will not do anything to let them down. So they know when they sponsor you or advocate for you, that you're going to show up with everything that you need to show up with and that you're going to deliver on it. And when you have that type of relationship, but it's also being vulnerable. I know um, I had my children um, mid-career. Mm -hmm. And so I struggled with this. How do I balance family you know, and progressing in my career. And in addition to having an unbelievably supportive husband who, you know, picked up duties with the children, you know, I had a mentor that I could go to. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how, how you know, what, what do I do? How, how do I choose? And they help you think through and work through those types of things. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I feel like we should bring you in for leadership mentorship lectures <laughs> in the college now, now listening to you. Um, and, and we appreciate that kind of um, that description and that really personal description of, of how you navigated all of that. So let's shift gears here a little bit. And I would love to hear from you what inspires you today about the future of engineering? Oh, wow. I, I think it's two aspects of it. One are the people, the engineers, okay? Um, I had the opportunity back in 2017, that seems like forever ago, but I came down to NC State and I had the opportunity to speak with the class of 2017 and the chemical bio um, class. And I'll tell you, Griffin, when I was looking at those young people and reading about their dual degrees and their graduating with honors, and I was just, I was more than inspired. 
And then when I was there not too long ago um, for an event, when um, they opened up the new, I went on the Centennial campus and mm -hmm. just walked around the library, the new um, Woodward Hall and all of that. And just to see the capability. So if you marry the, the bright minds of our young engineers with the technology and access that they have, to things and software and information, you can't help but be inspired because it says that anything is possible. I mean, anything is possible when you put the right resources and tools in the hands of curious, bright minds. And, and I get excited thinking about that. I mean, I consider myself an old person now, but <laughs> when I talk to these young kids and um, just, have a conversation with them. I know that we're in good hands and the future is extremely bright in yeah. engineering and everything else to tell you the truth. Yeah, gosh, Stephanie, that is a fantastic way to conclude that piece of our program. I think we are all ready to go out and serve and think and do and to be inspired by this next generation um, coming up behind us. So thank you. We're gonna switch gears here a little bit and take questions from the chat. We really wanna hear from you. And Stephanie said earlier, as we were getting, getting ready for this, she's great on her feet. So you can throw anything into the chat, but I've got one to get us started. Sounds like people would be interested to hear a little bit about the transition from working for the military versus working in industry. I bet you've got some interesting observations about the differences there, and we are all ears, ready to hear what you have to say. Yeah, so first I have to give a plug for anybody who has any desire or any thought about working for the Department of Defense. Um, it is an amazing place. And a lot of people think, like I did in the beginning, you know, I have to wear a uniform to do that. And you don't have to wear a uniform to contribute to the national security of our country and to support the men and women who defend it every day. So it, it was an honor for me to, to serve in that capacity. Um, one of the big differences, the military is very structured and formal. Normal. Okay, so as I came up through the ranks, um, I retired as a senior executive, and everything was Miss Easter, um, ma'am, you know, there's protocols, it's, it's just a totally different thing. I mean, everything's structured, everything has a beginning time and an end time. You know, so it was very structured, and it was really grueling hours for me and a lot of the jobs that I had. Um, unlike what a lot of people think about government jobs. I just want to get that on the record. <laughs> so when I went to industry, it was the exact opposite. Um, a lot more form informal, okay? A lot more flexibility. Um, still some structure, but not to the same degree. So if I had to choose between the two, they both have value and they're both needed, both. And it depends on what works best for you. Unfortunately, I'm able to navigate both. Um, but I think at this point in my career, I like the industry side a little better because of the flexibility. Like if I were still working for DOD, I'd be in the Pentagon today. Mm. But since I work for SAIC, I am home in my office study, you know, here <laughs> um, doing things. So it, it is really great. Um, both have a lot to offer. Coming up in DOD, we used to always look at industry and say we had a lot to learn from them on how flexible they are. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, having spent a year and a half out in industry, some industries, especially the defense industry, takes on the culture of their customer. So the flexibility really isn't a lot more. It's more, but it's not like 10 times more than it is in DOD. But they're yeah. both great environments to work in, for sure. Yeah. That's interesting. And I think in some ways you're getting at, you know, how do we continue to show up to a demanding job and give our best? So if you don't mind just sharing a little bit of personal information right now, what do you do to stay inspired? What do you do to, to recharge and, and keep coming back and solving all these problems and, and using that really um, intense critical thinking day after day? I mean, we, we talked about this. I stay connected with young people. I do a lot of mentoring and speaking on STEM, especially women and um, underrepresented girls in STEM. So I, I try to constantly stay in contact with people and sharing what I know and sharing my lessons learned because I truly believe, I mean, I accomplish what I accomplish because I stand on the shoulders of people who went before me. 
So I clearly see it as my responsibility to make my shoulders available for others. Mm -hmm. So I do that by doing outreach, by mentoring, um, not just young girls, but anybody who wants to talk and where I can share. And that's really what energizes me because I've had the opportunity to do some pretty amazing things. I think I shared, I've been underwear on a submarine. I've been on an aircraft carrier. I've flown in a presidential helicopter. <laughs> but the thing that gets me most excited mm -hmm. is when I speak to a group of people and weeks, months, years later, someone comes back and says, you know, you changed the trajectory of my career by challenging me to do this. Or I had never thought about that until I heard you put it in those terms. And that's what gets me excited. And that's what keeps me going to tell you the truth, knowing that I'm somehow making a small difference, you know, in a very small part of somebody's life. And mm -hmm. nothing's better than that for me. Nothing's better. Because so many people did that for me. Yeah. So I well, Stephanie, I got to tell you, I think you are making a difference. I think you're already getting some requests for mentorship in the chat. <laughs> so just get ready. You, you might have a following here. And if it's not classified, can you tell us who else was in the helicopter? I mean, was there a president in the helicopter with you that day? Okay. <laughs> no, it wasn't the president himself. So okay. um, one of this, I don't know if you're in the D.C. area or even if you watch the news, um, they call them the white tops. It's a green helicopter with the white top on it. And it's it's a VH3 is the nomenclature of it. And it lands on the lawn. So when I was an engineer at Naval Air Systems Command, I was the they call an avionics systems project officer for that helicopter. So that means I was responsible for helping with the design development and tests of all the avionics in the helicopter. So if you can imagine if you're the president or his cabinet and you're trying to land or get somewhere, communications is key to everything because he or she can never be disconnected. So they were having trouble with some of the communication. So we brought the helicopter down to PAX, did some testing on it, but in order to check out what we had done, we had to get airborne and do it. So I got to get in the back of the helicopter. We were hooking up thermocouples to radios and cables and everything and doing comms check with the White House Communication Agency, sure. um, uh, an experience of a lifetime. But I did get to sit um, in the, I call it the main part of the helicopter and each president puts in their own little touches, um, something I learned is not classified, that the um, first lady gets to choose the interior on those um, transport vehicles. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, so you get to see the taste and, you know, like some presidents, you know, like jelly beans and things like that. So you see a oh, little wow. jelly bean jar, you know, with the presidential seal on it and things of that nature. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That, that is, I feel like we've gotten such a treat and an insider scoop. I mean, we all hear about first ladies in their China, but I've never heard about first ladies in the helicopter interior. <laughs> uh, it's, that's pretty cool stuff. That's, that's, that's a pretty cool point of view that you've got there. Um, so we just had a, lots of affirmation in the chat. So many people enjoying this conversation, but I think it might be time for us to start wrapping up a little bit and to hear any concluding thoughts for you from you about um, your alumni experience and, and what it's like to serve as a volunteer and that kind of thing. Okay, well, I tell you, I am red and white for life. Um, anybody who knows me knows that. Anybody who follows my Facebook because I'm not quite a Twitter person. Um, the only time I post basically is um, when there's NC State football games and things of that nature. But, I will say this, I, I encourage everybody listening to get involved with the university, regardless of what your experience was. Um, because I know being at NC State back in the 90s, I'm just gonna keep it real if I may, um, mm -hmm. as a minority female, it, it wasn't always the best of experiences. I'm, I'm just gonna be honest with you. But the positive experiences there far outweigh the few challenges that I had. And when I have the opportunity every day to put into practice what I learned from the university, not just my engineering degree and my critical thinking skills, but as I shared before, teamwork. You know, um, my parents taught me you, you find 
the best in whatever you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So even in the midst of those challenges I had at NC State, um, I learned a lot. So when I got into the quote, real world, it wasn't much difference, but I was better prepared to deal with it because mm -hmm. of the challenges. And some might even say adversities that I had to face at NC State. Um, I shared this with the class when I came to speak back in 2017. And I'll leave names out of it. But one of my Kimmy professors, I mean, it wasn't a lot of female engineers in, in Kimmy 205. And even wondered, you know, out loud, why would, did women think they should be engineers? Mm -hmm. And the handful of women that were in that class, we were astonished by that. It's like, what do you mean? You know, it was like an uproar as much as an uproar happened back in the 80s. <laughs> but what I wanted, the reason I'm sharing this is because when I walked into the Department of the Navy in 1985, I walked into an organization that was the same way. Mm -hmm. There were two female engineers in that entire unit that I was in. So I was able to go back and reaffirm to myself, hey, you, you've been here, you've done this. OK, you can get through this. This is not going to knock you off your feet. OK, just take a breath and go with what you know, because you have done this before. So I encourage you to make your um, challenges and your adversities, make them the stepping stone for going beyond it. So regardless of what you experienced at NC State, whether it was the time of a lifetime, like when we won the championship in 1983, or, you know, whether it was the struggle of, you know, dealing with a particular individual that didn't have a broad perspective on, on different people and backgrounds, just keep in mind what you learned from that. And then give back and show up back at the university, if for no other reason to prove the people wrong, right? It's like, okay. <laughs> regardless of what I dealt with, I rose above it and I'm going to come back to this university and I'm going to make it even better. So get involved. Um, the university is great. I've had the opportunity to get involved with a lot of different things over the last two years and it, it has been so rewarding and I would encourage everybody to, to do the same thing. Yeah. Oh, Gosh, Stephanie, thank you. I mean, what yeah, inspiring, I know is the word of the day, so I'm trying not to repeat it too much, but you are inspiring. Your story is inspiring. And to the rest of you on the, the webinar today, we're going to put a um, form in the chat. It's a questionnaire that will help us share your stories. And I'll let Helene tell you a little more about that. Um, our goal on behalf of the staff here is to engage with you on your terms. What do you care about? That is really where the conversation starts. So Stephanie, thank you for representing our alumni. I'm just gonna finish by saying what I said earlier. We are so proud of you and so grateful for you. Uh, thank you, Griffin. And I wanna put in a plug for uh, my fellow alumni out there. I've seen some of the chat. So yeah, I'm gonna call you out, Mike Wright and all those other engineering alumni, share your story because you guys have had amazing careers as well. And I think it's so important to let everybody know that a degree from NC State prepares you for anything. And a degree for, in engineering for NC State will allow you to rule the world, okay? So if you could just share your story, take advantage of the link that's out there and don't let me be out here by myself, guys, hanging out, being the only one that comes forth and, and share my thoughts, all right? Terrific, terrific. Uh, I uh, love I, I love I love Griffin saying that you know inspiring is the word of the day, but like it's hard to not keep saying inspiring. Actually, that was so inspiring listening, uh, and I know that I Stephanie had something that I wrote down that I had never thought of it that way until you put it in those words. So you've uh, you know check your accomplishments, well done, uh, and I love that apparently we can all rule the world. So. 
<laughs> we're all so inspired. Um, but uh, you all said it fantastically. It, all of you alums out there, we want to hear your stories. And so click on that link in the chat. This is an opportunity. What we want to do is really build dialogue where we're all hearing about each other's stories, which are inspiring. We've all gone on to do very different things in our careers, and we want to really build that community. So fill out that form. What we're doing is we're posting on all different social channels, and then I encourage you all to watch. So follow us at NC State College of Engineering and the hashtag NC State ENGR. Uh, our goal is on a quarterly basis, we're going to have a gathering like this. And so watch uh, in May, we're going to be doing our next event, and we're excited to announce soon who that is going to be. Uh, but I will tell you, Stephanie, you, you know, set the bar where it is. So it's going to be uh, uh, hard to top this one, I think. But uh, share and comment when this post comes out. Do share this with your network so other people can hear her fantastic story as well and stay connected to us. And thanks so much for being here. And huge shout out to both Stephanie and Griffin leading this incredible conversation. Thank thanks you. for joining so, us. Helene, Go back. can I, um, I saw a question. Can I answer a question that was in yeah, the Yeah, by all means, sure. And yeah. it's, it's an easy one. So someone, I think it's Bruce Baldwin asked, for the annual Army Navy football oh. game, who do I root for? So quick story, um, I, spent, <laughs> I spent most of my career with Navy. So out of my 34 years in DOD, um, I spent 32 of them with Navy. So I always rooted for Navy. The first year, and Navy normally won, the first year I went to Army, Army beat Navy, okay? And the second year I was with Army, Army beat Navy. So I take full credit. <laughs> for Army beating Navy in the annual football games. And so as soon as I went back to Navy, that was all shot because then Army won a third year. So, but anyway, I, I normally go for Navy because that's where I spent the majority of my time, but I do pull for Army every now and then, at least the two years that I was there. So, so apparently you actually do rule the world. Hey, what can I say? <laughs> I'm an NC State grad. <laughs> And um, someone asked if I, oh, I think it's Bruce again. Um, I did know General Odenero. I did not get a chance to work with him. I was with Navy when he was with um, Army. So that's it. Sorry, I just saw those. I just thought it'll be a fun thing to comment on. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Thank you so much. Terrific job, everyone.